Hello and welcome to the Figgy Art Museum's Virtual Thursdays at the Figgy series. My name is Melissa Moore and I'm Director of Education here at the Figgy and I'm happy you could join us tonight. For the time being, we're hosting programs nearly every Thursday evening, so please check out the Figgy's website for topics and to register. We're able to offer these programs at no cost to you thanks to the generous sponsorship provided by Chris and Mary Rayburn. Chris and Mary, thank you so much. While these programs are free to watch, I encourage you to consider becoming a Figgy member. You know, your membership helps us continue to do many things, including fulfilling our mission of bringing art and people together, even when we can't be together in person. So a quick note about tonight's program. If you have any questions for our presenters, please enter them into the Q&A at any time and we'll get to them as we can. So at this time, it's my pleasure to introduce our featured speakers this evening, the artistic power couple, photographer Cara Romero and ceramicist Diego Romero. Cara Romero is a contemporary fine arts photographer. She's an enrolled citizen of the Chimawavi Indian tribe and Romero was raised between contrasting settings the rural reservation in the Mojave Desert in California and the urban sprawl of Houston, Texas. Her identity informs her photography, a blend of fine art and editorial photography shaped by years of study and a visceral approach to representing indigenous and non-indigenous cultural memory. Also, it represents collective history and lived experiences from a Native American female perspective. As an undergraduate at the University of Houston, Romero pursued a degree in cultural anthropology, disillusioned, however, by academic and media portrayals of Native Americans as bygone, he realized that making photographs could do more than anthropology did in words. That realization has led to a shift in medium. By staging theatrical compositions infused with dramatic color, she takes on the role of storyteller, using contemporary photography techniques to depict the modernity of Native peoples, illuminating indigenous worldviews and aspects of supernaturalism in everyday life. So Diego Romero has built a career constructing ceramic vessels that elevate Pueblo life to Olympian stature, firmly positioning his work within an indigenous visuality. A third generation professional artist, Romero was born and raised in Berkeley, California to a Cochiti father and a non-native mother. Upon completing high school, he returned to ancestral Pueblo lands and attended the Institute of American Indian Arts before subsequently attaining degrees from both Otis College of Arts and Design and the University of California, Los Angeles. Working in a narrative style that evokes pre-contact membranes pottery, as well as Greek amphorae and Anasazi ceramics, his earthenware bowls and handled vessels investigate the marginalized status of indigenous history and society. This investigatory nature of simultaneously inserting biographical material while interrogating the cross sections of Indian life enables him to transcend the commonly provincial status of contemporary Indian art. And with that, it is my pleasure to welcome Kara and Diego. Diego, I believe you're gonna get us started, so take it away. Thank you, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I always, um, say a picture is worth a thousand words. So I'm just gonna jump right in and start with um, a pretty recent work. Um, and uh, my wife's being so kind as to put it on the screen. There we go. Okay, so um, in the work I draw from, um, I kind of go through art history and culture like a salad bar and draw from many elements throughout time, mythology, socio-political, environmental, pop culture. In this particular piece, I've uh, drawn from a historic piece called um, Foot Race, which I saw in grad school um, at the Getty, which was a Greek amphora done by Ikios. And um, I've given it more of a pop twist. I did this when me and Carol were out in California. And um, I um, kind of, try to take something old and combine it and put something new to it. So you'll see I do quite a bit of that throughout um, the body of work. I've also added a Pueblo pot shape to this. So we got the Pueblo pottery shape, we've got, and techniques, and then we've got the um, historical reference of foot race, and then we've got the pop narrative of Keith Haring kind of going on there. Um, this is a much older piece. Um, this is quite a bit older. This piece is actually probably like 25 years older, but you can see it's um, again, 
um, going into the, I wanted to show this because it shows the progression and some of the ground or footwork which will appear later on in the later body of work. This piece is called Reclining Dinosaur, and uh, it's an environmental piece. This is a factory outside Bernalillo, which um, oddly enough also appeared in the Better Call Saul series. Um, I've put the Reclining Dinosaur on the bottom. Um, I always like to do these cutaway views of the earth. I think there's kind of looking at layers and mile markers in time. I'll talk about that as um, we go through the slideshow um as uh um anyway that's part of one of the elements that will reoccur throughout the body of work this was a a, a landscape piece um this piece was titled day of the earth pigs and one day i looked out the window and um of my friend's studio and i literally saw about 20 suvs roaming up and down the highway my friend had this studio that overlooked the um the on-ramp to the um, freeway, the 25 going south to Albuquerque. And um, this was the view. I've added the clouds from Toy Story in there. Um, I always um, get a kick out of uh, the um, big little, big little, big little. So there are Pueblo clouds, but they're placed in a Toy Story-like fashion. Um, I've got um, a classic kind of inventory of Pueblo designs and a traditional shape. But again, the, the subject matter is very contemporary. The little figures inside, I call them um, chungos, and they're named after the bun that they wear on the nap of the neck, which shows in the prehistoric pottery of the Mimbris. This little icon for man, I um, first started using him in grad school as a, a metaphor for the human race on a much broader scale, which, um, is probably actually not a metaphor. I'm sure that's how the members were using him too. So I just kind of lifted him directly out of time and placed him in a um, contemporary setting. Next. This was a, um, the Cadillac Ranch. And during this time, I was going back and forth quite a bit to Oklahoma. Um, I would always pass this ranch called the Cadillac Ranch. And I was um, pretty taken with it because he was doing the same thing with um, the environmental and the landscape that I was doing on the bowls. And uh, so one thing I'll always do in my pottery is I look at the landscape and um, it's very much the landscape. I really see it as, um, like I had said before, a mile marker in time, that the landscape is very reflective of where we are in time and space in relation to the the earth. And like I said, and we're as we as humans, as where we sit in the greater continuum of time and space and reality. This is the reverse side of Day of the Earth Pigs. And the Earth Pig is the SUV. So that's um, kind of a, a name. I got that out of a comic book, um, which um, was titled um, Cerebus, the Earth Pig. <laughs> and um, I just used it as a kind of a, a little catchy phrase for an SUV at that point. Um, we really don't see, this is actually an old piece because we don't see that many SUVs anymore. I'm, I'm glad to say. Um, you can hit the right arrow. This one? Yes. Okay. This was called American Dream. This was, uh, I did this pot shortly after grad school and um, I was li literally surviving off 99 cent hamburgers. So um, the fact that I was living off of 99 cent hamburgers um, and the fact that um, I, there were so many people and still are that wanted to come to America in pursuit of this dream, all kind of came together. And um, I kind of lifted this from um, that scene in the Monty Python movie, um, the Holy Grail where the clouds part and um, uh, God comes down to Arthur and instructs him to find the grail. So I always found that um, movie kind of amusing. I draw a lot from movies, comic books, pop culture. It all kind of comes together in this um, kind of, uh, like I said, almost like a, a salad bar type formation. I pick and choose what I want and I um, reassemble it in my own kind of fashion with a little dash of Keith Haring there, right? <clears throat> maybe not a little, maybe, maybe a big dash of Keith Haring in there. Um, 
This is a, a pot, again, it was reflective of the landscape outside of my house on Alameda. Um, I was taken with this particular stone building to the right, which shows up again and again in many of my pots. I guess um, for some reason, this building has always attracted me and um, uh, kind of mystified me. And I've always, I always went, who lives there? What do they do? What is this building? I don't know, but it always showed up in my pots as well as the SUV and the members caricature on the traditional shape with the traditional design vocabulary. <clears throat> this piece was titled Sisyphus and he's drawing directly from Greek mythology. And um, at this point in my life, I was married and raising um, four children um, six all together, um, and every day felt like this uphill struggle. And literally, um, I felt like Sisyphus pushing this giant boulder up this um, mount mountainside. And um, every night, the boulder would roll me back over and crush me, and I would start from the bottom of the hill again. <clears throat> this piece comes um, out of the 9-11, and it was titled Guernica. And uh, I was, uh, it was shortly after 9-11, it was in the news every day. I was watching it on CNN, these events unfold. And there was um, an art history book on my table that just happened to be open to the page that had Picasso's Guernica on it. So the, it just seemed um, like a kind of um, a message that um, this was to be the next piece. I've altered the image a little bit, like I do everything and, and re reformed it to, to my own fashion. Um, I remember um, that uh, I was taken with this one particular image of this man removing his um, child from the rubble. Um, again, like I said, it was shortly after 9-11 and we had um, reprised in turn by um, dropping a lot of um, missiles on, uh, you know, um, the Middle East uh, at that point, we were bombing the heck out of them. Um, and um, so you have the cascade of bombs or missiles, which on the other side of the pot, they'll actually come out of the um, clouds and the fire of the 9-11 as a reprisal to the, um, uh, the um, I guess I wanna say Afghans, but it seemed like it was more Iraq that we were bombing at that point. Um, this, this is uh, the other side, the reverse pot, and um, you can see the beginnings of the smoke trails um, on the far left that will later become the cascade of missiles falling on the mother and the child. Um, one of the things that um, uh, I guess was seared in my head as I watched this all unfold was the people leaping from the Twin Towers that they were on fire. and. Um, I don't know, for some reason that um, always just resonated with me that it was better to leap to your death than burn alive. And um, this image of these people falling from the building emulated just was seared in my brain. So I've kind of combined again, um, the so Guernica with the Twin Towers, with the um, uh, events of the time on a Pueblo form. And um, uh, anyway. This was a piece um, during my, um, uh, the height of my alcoholic addiction. I'm a recovering alcoholic. Um, I, this has been a struggle, um, which I'm glad to say um, less so. I've been sober now for um, probably 18 years, 17 years. And, um, but this was, this piece is probably about 17 years old. And it was done, like I said, at the um, height of my addiction. And I realized at this point, I remember um, I always knew I had a problem. I had a problem, but I always never really realized how far down the bottle hole I had gone and how heavily addicted I was. And it wasn't until I tried to stop and I realized that I couldn't, that I realized I had a real problem. This is the reverse side of the pot. And um, as you can see, it's, it's um, him being sucked back in he's trying to get away from um this addiction um which was um me trying to get out of my alcoholic uh life at that point this piece is titled um in the beginning and it was one of a series of pieces 
that um, I had done combining, um, I guess I want to say Darwinism with creation and giving it a Native American twist. So this story goes, um, in the beginning, the creator gave all creatures a tail, but he gave man the greatest tail of all. And this made all the other animals in the universe jealous. And they went to the creator and they said, creator, we have a problem with this man. He, he has no shame. He, he waves his tail about the plaza and he flaunts it in front of us. And he makes us all feel really small and little that his tail is greater than ours. And, and the creator said, I, I've noticed this, this man, he has no humility. He's, he's full of hubris and we'll ha we have to teach him a lesson. So we'll have a, a giant feast. And, and when, we get all drunk and passed out, then we'll take his tail from him in the middle of the night. So they go ahead and they do this, but this has the opposite effect. For when man wakes up in the morning with no tail, he realizes he's better than all the other creatures of the universe and um, is more vain and more narcissistic than ever. <clears throat> Speaking of narcissists, um, here we have a, a, a piece that's actually titled Narcissist. And um, this piece always amused me because uh, if you actually stand by the water, um, that's actually how it looks. Your feet are actually cut off. So um, we have this kind of um, odd view, but that's um, of the feet on the top and the um, guy admiring himself in the pool of water. But that's, um, like I said, even though there seems to be some twist to it, that's actually more real than is not. So that's... Um, was always, I, I guess, in my own narcissistic way, I patted myself on the back for this keen observation and um, put it in a ball. And um, uh, at the time, I remember um, it brought a lot of questions to myself. Um, was I a narcissist? Um, how far had, had I gone down the rabbit hole of ego? And um, uh, at this point, I had kind of, I was becoming a famous artist and um, this was all playing into my life. These were all the questions I was asking. Anyway, at the end of the day, I came to the conclusion that while I did hold some narcissistic tendencies, <laughs> I was not truly a narcissist. <clears throat> um, this is a landscape. This is a, uh, the sky is done in a fashion that I refer to as the Kirby crackle. Kirby, um, his name was Jack Kirby. He drew comic books for Marvel. Um, he's particularly known for his Fantastic Four comics. And he did this uh, amazing skies that have these energetic, just um, cascades of light and explosions and quasars and um, planets emerging. And I always felt that if you had Superman's vision and you could actually see into the night sky, that you would actually be able to see the universe unfolding at a uh, with a superhuman telescope, you could see the, the universe popping and exploding and things emerging and planets dying and, and um, planets being born. So this is kind of um, uh, observation of a New Mexico landscape. We have the burn can, the trailer house and the um, abandoned car with the little dog and they're playing guitar out underneath this incredible night sky. This was a piece titled Don't Shoot Diego. It was one of many lithographs I did. I always kind of um, uh, amused myself by the dialogue here. He says, don't shoot Diego, but they are enemies of the church. And this is war, translated from Spanish. Um, well, I always have fun with um, Diego, the famous conquistador. I bear his namesake. It's a little ironic, but um, it's part of our history. I'm proud of the name but it's also a name that can be viewed as, it doesn't come without a history, let's just say that. <laughs> this is Pueb Fiction. This is one of my um, formulas that I use of, I call it pop appropriation, pueblification. And I take a really popular pop image and I kind of turn it native. I re recontextualize it in a native fashion. So we have um, Uma Thurman here but she's dressed in Pueblo attire, taking her um, break during Coach D Feast, the lunch break, and um, reading, amusing herself by reading the book called Coach D. <clears throat> Environmental landscape, again, with the um, factories and the uh, 
uh, night, the Kirby Crackle, Night Sky, Abandoned Trucks, um, the side view of the um, ground underneath. Um, kind of like, this is kind of like all the fixings in one type deal. This piece was taken during Coach D Feast. And if you ever come to a Pueblo um, for our dances, you'll, you'll enter the village and there'll be a big sign that says positively no sketching, recording, picture taking, or um, recording of any kind. And um, which is all um, well and understood. But this particular incident happened, um, the girl from within the culture pulled the cell phone out from her belt and took the picture. So it raised the interesting question as, um, does it become okay when it's done from someone within the culture? Um, most people would, after seeing this pot, said the answer was absolutely no, that um, the rules apply to the people within as well as without when it comes to picture taking, recording, penciling, or sketching. But um, by our, um, anyway, so here we have it. Um, ironically enough, I suppose um, I would be, um, uh, in my mind, though I didn't sketch it, I did illustrate this uh, particular moment in time, which brings, which I would probably come into question in and of itself. So the whole piece is very controversial. It's more of an observation of what you can do within the culture and what you can do um, and what you're not supposed to do. So we have some people and they're kind of smitten and stepping into the photo, while we have other people that are kind of pulling away or shying, shying away and wondering if this is right or if this is a good thing. This is a observation off the um, Interstate 10 um, and it was titled A Bright New Day. And um, here again, it's the, um, an environmental landscape, but um, more of an optimistic view rather than um, the, uh, uh, the negative view of the um, possibilities that the future holds. This is, um, again, pop appropriation, publication. We have our old friend, the Mutant Ninja Turtles here, um, Donatello Leonardo, Michael Angelo, um, but they're all done as Pueblo deities. Um, so with the little twist of the Kirby crackle. <clears throat> this is titled Girl in the Anthropocene. And um, to the right is the girl. She's out there um, hanging laundry with her mother who is very pregnant. They go about the mundane of their daily lives but they do so in the shadow of big industry. If you are, um, uh, this is actually brings a term called environmental racism to the um, question. And um, if you are uh, of a minority culture, maybe not even minority, if you're poor, you could be in Appalachia or in Oklahoma or in Southern Arizona. But if you don't have a legal voice or money to represent you, big industry will build and dump their waste in your backyard. This affects your everyday life and your unborn children and your children. So this piece kind of talks about this. Um, we have her, and it references that there's a boy in the picture too because of the football on the shirt. This piece was uh, done in, um, I guess I want to say, um, conjunction with the canonization of Junipa Sierra. Is that right? Junipera Sierra. Junipera Sierra. And he was a Catholic priest that was very brutal to the Indians of Southern California. And he was recently canonized and the Indians were very upset about this and had protests. So this piece was um, uh, done for a museum in California. There was a print that was later made from this and oddly enough, it wound up at the Theological Institutes in Boston where it hangs at the seventh station of the cross. They felt that this character or this individual that's being oppressed was um, in fact a native Jesus. And um, that this was um, a piece that they would use to educate the priests um, on the um, do's and don'ts of proselytizing. And, you know, I guess they have to go on these missions where they um, educate cultures and people about Christianity. Anyway, 
this, they use this to explain that you, you can no longer do this. While it's good to bring Christianity to the people of the world, um, you can't whip them, beat them, and torture them in the process. This was another environmental piece. This is a uh, glass boy, Chungo. Um, and uh, it's kind of, you'll see this again. This is drawn from a piece that was drawn from a piece that was drawn from the last scene of Planet of the Apes. <laughs> so, but you'll actually see a reference to the piece that this was drawn from. This was, this is a museum in Santa Fe that sits atop um, Museum Hill. And they have a giant statue of this uh, Apache Gan dancer. And um, so here we have this kind of futuristic notion of the crumbling sculpture and the museum eventually underwater. In order for this to occur, um, Santa Fe would have to be underwater and we have a pretty high elevation. So um, this shouldn't happen for some time, but um, here again, um, never know, you know. I remember as a kid, I would walk down the street in Berkeley called San Pablo Avenue. And I would always think to myself, someday this street will be underwater, but I never thought it would be in my lifetime. Here again, we have Coyote uh, in a mythological reference, ascending with fire. In the mythology of the Native American, Coyote brings fire to man. He steals it from the fire god and brings it to man and um, who's living in darkness up until that point. So he comes down. Um, in this case, he's coming like a rock star, right? And it's a giant mosh pit of humanity. I thought it was interesting to throw the cell phones in there because it references um, the relation of mythology and to the native and the here and the now, how these myths sit in time and space and resonate in the present as well as in the past. This is the reverse, reverse side of the pot. And um, again, we have just the mosh pit of people and um, the Kirby crackle. And I've put this on a, a gourd shape. I, I'm very fond of gourd pots. Um, they reference, um, I guess, my identity or the identity of the potter. I, I wanna say the history of ceramics, that the very first ceramics to be made imitated gourds because we drank out of gourds before we drank out of pots. So as man kind of thinks, um, we kind of make our very first pots to emulate. If something works, don't break it, right? So our very first containers are made to make um, the shapes of the gourds that we use prior to that to carry water. So anyway, the gourd goes way back to the very beginning of ceramic history. And um, I like to use it just for that reason alone, but um, it's also a very pleasing aesthetic shape. It's kind of got this like bulbous little top bottom, a nice neck, good flow to it. I love gourd pots. This is the piece in the Figgy Museum and it's titled, Dust Spoke Popeye. And um, again, it's drawing from um, the, um, I don't want to say mythology, but the actual history of the Pueblo Revolt and our relationship to colonialism. And um, basically, in my own experience, I would open up in the educational system, we had very few references to the Pueblo Revolt and the history of it. We had lots of Gettysburg, Washington crossing the Delaware, um, you know, yada, yada, yada. Um, but very little regarding um, the history of the Southwest or the Pueblo Indians. So I was always captivated and I always researched on my own this um, aspect of uh, this little forgotten window into time of the history of the Southwest and the Indians. So there was this period where the Pueblo Indians unite and they um, revolt against the colonial powers of the Spaniards who at that point have been oppressing them. And um, this whole um, re revolt is orchestrated by one, by several people, but um, Pope stands out among many that, that as the orchestrator of the Pebble Revolt. And I do want to point out, which I will later in this lecture, that he was not the only one and he did not do this alone, but he does seem to be accredited for it. So I thought it'd be interesting to give him sandals. Um, we were a sandal people, the Pueblo Indian at one point in history. So I've given him these giant um, yucca 
sandals. Um, I was always um, taken by this book called Thus Spoke Tharthusa. Um, I always liked the title and uh, I thought at some point I would use it. So I here it is, it has a little um, comic book like banner in the corner and um, it has a wounded conquistador and a wounded um, priest and Pope is telling them enough. I, I won't stand, enough is enough. I, I can't stand no more. <laughs> okay, let's go on. Um, this is uh, uh, two Greek hopolites from the gates of Troy. Um, again, just playing on mythology, um, my love and passion for Greek pottery, as well as Mimbris. Um, I'm a big fan of all sorts of narrative. I love comic books, but I also love, um, I think the first comic books were actually Greek pottery. We look at the old Greek um, pots and you see Hercules going down to Hades, hitting Cerebus over the head, coming out. Um, so you have these um, great adventures and these great stories of heroes and superheroes all done on pottery. Um, well beyond comics, but they are picture narratives. And um, to me, um, a picture is worth a thousand words. And I love narrative. So, um, and I love mythology. So it all kind of comes together again, like I said, in this hodgepodge or this gumbo of history, mythology, pottery, um, pop culture, art, um, pop art, um, autobiography, period. This is uh, another gourd pot. I was sitting in the studio one night late watching a special on the Science Channel and it was Neil Grass de Tyson. And he was talking about the wormhole and how you would go through these holes in time and space and come out on other sides of the universe. And that we might not come out exactly the same, that we would come out, we could come out different or, or that there was these parallel universes that have parallel realities. So basically that's the inspiration for this. And he's like going through the wormhole of time and space and, and coming out in a different place. I also wanna add, this was influenced by a movie I saw as a kid that resounded with me all through my life. It was called The Yellow Submarine. I saw this movie as a kid and um, I still watch it to this day. And I love that scene when one of the Beatles, I think it's um, Ringo looks through the hole and sees his feet dangling. They're looking, it's the nowhere man. They're, they're in this giant white void on the screen that has all these holes. And he pokes his head through and he sees his feet dangling on the other uh, side of the, um, the universe, so to speak. So um, we have the Kirby Crackle, we have the Yellow Submarine, we have Neil Grass the Tyson, we have the character Chungo from the Members Pottery, and we have the Kirby Crackle and the Gourd Shape all kind of, again, tossed into this one hodgepodge of uh, work, a uh, contemporary piece of pottery. Here we have the, actually the direct scene from Planet of the Apes that was drawn from the previous pot that I showed you of The Last Boy. So this is that scene from um, Planet of the Apes where Charlton Heston's riding down the um, coast and he uh, comes across the Statue of Liberty and he says, no! And uh, anyway, I don't know, that always stuck in my head. I was like, I'm gonna use that someday. So I've done it several times at this point. This was um, during the height of uh, the Kim Young Jong Trump back and forth. He was calling him um, Rocket Man. And this was a piece done for the LA Me County Museum. And they said, um, make it political. So I was like, okay, I'll, I'll make it political. And again, we've uh, got um, the, uh, the contemporary dialogue of the current event of the time, Kim Young Jung and Trump and Rocket Man, but we've given it this kind of Dr. Strange glove twist and um, uh, we've updated it. Instead of falling down on a bomb, he's riding an interballistic missile. And um, again, um, as in the Guernica pot, we have this fabulous, fabulous jet trail, right? Streaming out from these rockets. I always. I, there's certain things I love to do, um, jet trails, um, clouds, um, explosions, um, outer space, 
Um, some stuff just is um, uh, more fun and um, really looks cool. I don't know what else to say other than I just have um, my little favorites in that bag of tricks that I pull from. <clears throat> and finally, this would be the final piece that I did just recently for the um, IA Museum, but I did it for the uh, Pueblo Indian Art Market up at Pawaki. And um, it's again, it's the Pueblo Revolt. Um, he's um, hurling a priest, he's casting him out. We have the burning church on the right. And uh, I remember um, back to our, the original um, dialogue of earlier, someone came by and they looked at it and they said, is that Pope? Is that Pope? And I said, it, it could be, I guess, <laughs> if you want to be sure it's, it's Pope. Um, but it really could be anybody. Pope did not do it alone. Um, he was one of many Pueblo warriors and chiefs that um, uh, rose up in the face of oppression and colonialism and dispelled both the Spaniards and the Catholic Church, who of course later come back to recolonize the territory. Um, I address that later in a pot, um, but um, for now, um, that would be a, a, a wrap. Thank you for your time. <laughs> <laughs> that is so good, that was a good talk. Um, I can see that there are questions popping up um, and so I think I'm going to go ahead and ask the questions relevant to you before I just tell people what I've been up to. Is that okay? That However works. you okay. want to do it. Um, but I don't want to a, take all the time. No, okay. okay. Um, Diana Lovett asks, in the borders of your work, I'm going to ask you all okay. of them because okay. I know you can't see that small. In the borders of your work, so there's a white separation where the two sides are not joined. That's called a line break or a spirit trail. That's like a um, spiritual disclaimer. Um, so my body and soul are no longer connected to the um, piece. Do your children ever suggest themes and designs to you? My children aren't as interested in what I do as <laughs> I would like, unfortunately. Sometimes they show up in your pots though. Sometimes they, sometimes they show up in my pots. Yes, that is true. Oh, this is an interesting one. Do you sign and date your works? I do, but I use a non de pure. Is that right? <laughs> I use an alias. Tell them what it is. It's called Chango. Okay. Um, do traditional Pueblo potters see your art? Question mark. Do they express opinions about your imagery? All the time. They either love it or hate it. <laughs> That's pretty. Okay. Um, and we're going to open it back up to q and I just wanted to answer those before um, we go on. So uh, I'm flattered to be asked, Diego, you did such a good talk. I'm just going to um, follow up with a quick portion. I was so thankful to have already spoken um, to your group last year. And uh, Andrew had asked um, just to see what I was up to. And so, um, you know, my practice has changed a lot with COVID and um, safety precautions. And, you know, I um, work with my community, my friends and my family a lot become the subjects of my pieces. And um, I was commissioned to do a series, a body of work in Southern California, which was very exciting. It was a great homecoming for me um, to go back to the place I was born in Los Angeles. And uh, make works there in um, the Los Angeles area. And uh, by about November of 2020, um, we really couldn't figure out um, how that was ever going to happen. You know, everything was has been so scary. And, you know, we uh, obviously share the sentiment that we hope you and your families have all um, been okay. And uh, we looked at each other in November of last year and we said, um, why don't we go as a family um, to take our quarantine pod out to the geography? And uh, I made a body of work that was a first for me, um, working really closely um, with our daughter, who is a dancer and in the place of um, creationism for many Southern California people, people don't think of Los Angeles in that way. Um, but truly for people of the desert and of Southern California, um, you know, the Pacific Ocean and the place of angels uh, is the, pardon me, the spirit of the ocean um, has to do with our creation mythos. 
And so we went out there as a family and for three months, um, we shared time together and I made many um, really intimate photographs. This is our daughter, um, Cricket, and um, we worked together, Diego and my son held the lights out there uh, on the ocean side. We stayed um, um, very close to the beach and we uh, told a story as a family together in study. And um, we must have gone out, my daughter and I, for I think about three weeks straight, yeah, day night. after day, um, you know, creating pieces together. And those are the pieces that I just wanted to share um, with all of you. Uh, this was also done in collaboration with Leah Mata Frawa. She's one of the most celebrated regalia makers in all of California. And she's a keeper and purveyor of um, traditional uh, ecological arts and techniques of California people, including our bark skirts, um, our hand sewn feathers, um, the hand cutting and shaping of abalone, um, the, the shell making art and jewelry, um, uh, natural paints like red ochre. And um, she made this all indigenous contemporary dancewear using all of those traditional techniques and bringing them forward in time. Um, our daughter's a dancer at New Mexico School of the Arts on Point. And we've seen throughout the years uh, many times where internal bias of the choreographers or the people um, casting, um, she won't always make the lead role um, because of the color of her skin. And as we have surveyed our indigenous community, it's unfortunately a story um, that repeats itself um, for indigenous dancers and women of color dancers. So um, we made a beautiful portrait of Cricket um, front and center stage um, wearing all indigenous dance wear. Her Russian skirt is made from willow bark. Her corset is made from um, you know, thousands of hand sewn feathers. Instead of sequins, it is all um, hand cut abalone. The straps are um, Tule Cordage and her pink ballerina shoes we painted with red ochre. Um, this one is called Paso Robles, taken there um, in the geography of Paso Robles, California. Um, just a beautiful black and white image. Uh, a really interesting study of finding undeveloped um, spaces where we as indigenous women could put our feet on the ground in um, an overdeveloped industrial empire of Los Angeles. Um, what was very interesting um, being in the geography is uh, it is a lesser known colonial history, the, the history of California native peoples. And in California, there are 55 tribes altogether that never received their federal recognition. Uh, 19 of those, they're called the 19 unratified treaties, all belong to the coast of California. Um, this next piece um, is in response to the 19 unratified treaties um, along the coast. And it was no coincidence that those areas of Los Angeles and the Central Coast, um, all the way up to San Francisco, were rich in oil and gold. Um, which is the title of this piece. And Leah and Mata and our daughters, um, respectively mine on the left and hers on the right, um, have traditional regalia of California peoples um, dipped in gold and oil. And it speaks to a truthful, um, you know, colonial history told from indigenous perspective about the displacement of California native peoples who are still dispossessed of land base and federal recognition in California. Um, in you know, the most sought after real estate in the United States. Um, and this is true not only for Los Angeles, but also um, in New York and Manhattan, um, which also has the, the highest Native American population, um, Los Angeles having the second highest Native population um, in the United States. So I encourage everybody to um, seek more information about um, the 19 unratified tribes along the coast of California, as you begin to like see more scholarly discourse and discourse in the news about, um, you know, hashtag land back, which is this idea of giving stewardship and land back, not only to federally recognized tribes, but also people um, that never received their federal recognition, like in California. 
And this final piece um, was taken, it's called Weshoyot. And Weshoyot is a Tongva native person um, from Los Angeles. So she is a descendant of the first peoples. They are sometimes called Keech, sometimes called Gabrielino peoples of the Los Angeles area. And this was um, an underwater piece that I did in Long Beach. Um, you know, it was an incredible journey and story for us to be in LA and grounded with the first peoples of Los Angeles for three months. I learned so much, um, not only about their creation stories, but also about their history in uh, Los Angeles. And it is a tragic history. Um, and like many tribes and many purveyors of culture, they have so much that exists against all odds. And um, the Tongva Gabrielino people of the Los Angeles Basin and the Four Channel Islands are um, no different. Uh, they have an incredible story. Um, this is the traditional regalia um, of the Tongva um, people of Los Angeles. Um, they are fisher people, they're ocean people, of course, along the coast of California. And um, thank you so much for letting me share that little bit of uh, work that we did while we were in California. Diego made the pot, um, the runners that he started out his slideshow with. And um, without further ado, we'll open it up to uh, any other questions. I'm gonna open up um, that. Oh, Andrew says, awesome, thank you. <laughs> A question came to me directly from someone. What are you watching right now? Are there any recent movies that have inspired you in your work? Reservation Dogs, right? Yeah, we've been and, watching and, Reservation and, Dogs. Yeah, and uh, I like that one, um, Suicide Squad. Suicide Squad, <laughs> yeah. Um, he's always into the pop. Uh, he watches everything Marvel and everything DC, right? Yeah. And um, I'm more into artistic movies, <laughs> artsy independent movies, which he always enjoys when he watches. Um, we're watching Reservation Dogs, which is, uh, you know, co- um, produced by our friend Sterling Harjo. He's Muskogee Creek um, from Oklahoma, as well as Taika Waititi, who's um, a Maori um, and, you know, very famous director. And they've done a series um, that Indian Country is celebrating right now. It's available on Hulu. And they're all, um, you know, uh, reservation dogs or kids um, from a uh, very rural Oklahoma. It's all very close to heart. And um, each episode has a different writer and director and they range from, um, you know, real life stories and, you know, incredible sense of humor into magical realism and the supernatural. They're and great. So they're really they're great. great. Kara and I both lived in Oklahoma for Part of our life yes so it was it, it really resonated with us and i guess other than that i've been doing um a little bit more research also on um the genre of film noir and i'll have a series coming out next year um with you know kind of this idea that pops up for diego and i kind of a, a retelling of stories and of histories um with the inclusion of native voice and representation so you know, what if a native wrote history? What if a native wrote a film noir? What would the subject matter be? And um, we let our imagination go from there. I'm gonna open up the Q&A, wonderful work, thank you. Um, do you share or exchange ideas or try to work separately? I'd say we share and exchange ideas all the time. Every night we talk about something, right? We talk about art um, all the time, and uh, I enjoy that yeah, a lot. Yeah, it's a beautiful part of our relationship. We critique mm -hmm. each other gently. Yeah, <laughs> I would say yeah. that. Um, we share ideas. Um, sometimes I'll photograph stuff for Diego to work from. Um, and a lot of times, like during my editing process, I'll check in with him on, you know, whatever I think is great visually? Do you think it's great visually? Sometimes we agree, sometimes we don't. Um, I, it's, it's a good balance. We, yeah, yeah. We, we inspire each other. Sometimes I'll have an idea and I'll think to myself after I've had this great idea that Diego's already done it too. And I'll say, do you mind if I do something similar? <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> 
that's what I do. <laughs> I always tell her, I got, I, I got, I got the idea off a comic book or an album cover <laughs> when I was a kid. I saw this album cover and I, I think art, about it years art is a conversation too. I yeah. mean, I think you know that is the truth of it. Is it's you know whether it's a a conversation between pop culture and tradition. It's also a conversation between artists that have walked on and artists that are still making art. And sometimes there's so much um, that we hold in our subconscious of things that we've seen. Everything. Yeah. Er everything that, that um, manifests itself in the art um, comes from um, some place in the, um, I wouldn't even say subconscious, but um, comes from the um, memory uh, library, so to speak. I think we're out of questions if you guys don't be shy. Yeah. No. <laughs> oh, here we go. Um, oh, here's some more questions. Sorry. Uh, do you, either of you speak any indigenous languages? Not enough. Just, Not enough. Just table manners. <laughs> table manners. I um, have taken several classes back home. We don't have very many language speakers left. So I kind of tease sometimes and say I speak like a toddler and know my colors and my numbers and table manners and things like that. Um, but I do uh, support all of our um, indigenous language keepers and um, revitalization efforts that we have going on back at Chimwebi through our cultural center. Um, I love the irony of the Pueblo revolt against Spain being led by someone named Pope or Pope. Thanks for your sense of humor and political passion. You're welcome. Well, Diego and Kara, I want to thank you so much for spending time with us this evening, sharing your passion and your talents, and also for sharing your art with us in our galleries. Um, it, it's such a pleasure to reconnect with you through Figgy Programming, Kara and Diego. I hope this is the first of many times we're able to connect, maybe even someday in person with both of you. I know you've both um, Zoomed with us now. But uh, I know Andrew Wallace, our director of collections and exhibitions, is as eager as I am to get you to the Quad Cities to visit the Figgy Art Museum in person. So hopefully we can make that happen when it's safe to do so. Can't wait. We'd love that. Yeah. Thank you also to our audience members who are here joining us on Zoom and for those who will be watching us later through the video recording. I know you're anxious to come and see Diego's piece that is on display in our permanent collection. So that's gonna be up for a while. That's on level two. If you do plan to come to the museum, just keep in mind, we do have certain policies in place right now, such as a um, mask mandate. And if you forget your mask when you get there, don't worry, we have some for free that you can grab from the front desk. So thank you again to our audience members for joining us, to Diego and Kara for sharing, again, your talent and passion with us tonight and your sense of humor and your passion for politics and everything. There's so much for us to think about now as we move forward. Well, thank you. Um, so until next time, we'll just end with gratitude and um, yeah, we look forward to seeing and hearing from both of you again and to seeing our audiences either through another Zoom program, again, check the website for more of those or in person at the museum, of course, with a mask on. So thanks again and have a wonderful evening, everyone. Good night. Good night.